location that live nearby the rivers. And this water is directly related to the life, the community life. This community uh, used to fish on the rivers and they had to stop fishing on the rivers. They had to stop swimming on the river. And tourism as or do not come to this place due to water pollution and bad smells. This is having also health impacts because the population are having uh, more skin cancer. And as I was saying, there's a lack of in information. Communities are not aware of the, of the things that Pronaca is doing and they do not know the expansion and what this will mean to their territories. They do not have the knowledge of the expansion of the central price. And we, as an organization and as a collective, we understand that there's an issue that, and we haven't found a solution. So if we add 100 million additional to uh, the expansion, this problem will get worse. We don't really know which will be the the expansion and because the banks just tell us that they don't they cannot share this information with us however we think we also have an, a lack of um, consultation the indigenous people haven't had any information about this operation as it is written within the um the constitution of equator the legislation says that each new expansion of the activity needs to be done with uh, with a report of activity. However, as we are saying to you, they are not getting new licenses. They are not taking into account all the impact of uh, the pollution. And so we are doing a report what well, we are saying that they are not complying with all the rules imposed. In some way, as they receive some loans from the banks, we see that Pronaca has a lot of influence within the governments, in the local governments. And we think that Pronaca needs to respect the Equatorian legislation and also with the rules, the bank rules, which are pretty uh, strict. We are seeing that they are not complying, they are not meeting the objective number one, the number three concerning pollution. They are not meeting the PC4 concerning security. And then there's a problem again with the PC6 concerning the supply chain. They are not meeting the, the rule seven concerning indigenous um, indigenous people. We as a collective, we have done some recommendations into the local um, government. First was to, to publish all this information then to have more requirement concerning the supply chain of the enterprise to find a solution to this problem, which is not solved since 9, uh, 20, uh, 2009, to see which are the conversations that are still needed. And then we need to take into account that in, Equ in Ecuador, nature is recognized as having rights so that we need to recognize the rights of uh, of rivers and enterprise should take care of these rivers. We are, we are equally doing some recommendations for the government in order to guarantee that these enterprises will meet all the requirements. We, want to, uh, we also want to recognize the rights of local communities and the rights of nature. This, uh, these resolutions that I'm talking, that I'm mentioning uh, will appear in the report that will be launched within one month. And these are really important because the biggest part of the population do not know all the 
uh, the loan, do not know what is going to happen with the expansion. And we also know that this enterprise has some environmental issues that, and then there's the lack of information by the local communities. So we need to find a solution to all these issues. We want to get together this report with all the campaigns, national campaigns concerning an increase of the exploitation of animals and understand that there are different ways of, of achieving a real food sovereignty, which will be more friendly with nature, with food production um, resources, and to uh, achieve a registration income. I will stop over here. Thank you so much for listening to me, for paying attention, and we will uh, soon send you this report. Por apegarse al tiempo, gracias a Sedema por aceptar esta invitación, por participar, por las reflexiones. Thank you, Sedema, to, uh, to share with us these reflections from Sedema. And although it has nos permite uh, some common points with other points of livestock, it helps us identify some points about intensive livestock with uh, extensive. And uh, it's very interesting how uh, Nat is uh, talking about the corporate culture uh, in this sector. And it's important for us to understand uh, how that we have to dismantle this corporation takeover in order to recover the security and the autonomy of uh, food security and sovereignty for these corporations that are uh, taking their hand on, on water, on land. And we have to remember that earth and water flow to power and we need to strengthen uh, at community level in order to face corporative power. And thank you, Natalie, to, for sharing all these reflections with us. Now we're going to give the floor to Miguel Lovera for the Center of uh, Promoting uh, Miguel is engineer in agronomy. He is uh, he has dedicated his life to uh, protect seeds. He is going to share with us uh, his thesis that the cows uh, are eating Paraguay, and he will do it in 10 minutes, and that's going to be a big uh, challenge. But uh, thank you. Thank you to Genoi, to Miguel, and uh, to the initiative Moto for the to accept the invitation because there are also member organizations from Latin America. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, very happy to be here with all the colleagues and friends from the Coalition of the Forests, our, our old organization. I want to share with you a PowerPoint presentation that I don't know where it is. There we go. Aquí estamos con el un país devorado por las vacas. 
uh, Paraguay as a country eaten by the cows. And I put this uh, title because I don't want I don't want to make it so direct. But Paraguay is a country that has been given to livestock from very early in its story. The livestock in South America starts in Paraguay in the colonial or proto-colonial Paraguay with one bull and seven cows. In 1545, looks like it's very, very, uh, it's documented and it's very accurate because uh, the, the contability at that time was very easy and very concrete. And it has expanded in all South America in Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, south of Brazil, the, the livestock in that in that place where one cow and seven uh, one bull and seven cows came, it is now 13 million. That means like two heads per person is one of the main. Uh, exporters, um, only talking about uh, about cow production, because it's the one that impacts more on the country, on the economy, and in the environment. A country where that production, 90, a little bit more, is being exported to countries all around the world. And it's a business that is very far from the local uh, business where uh, one could manage a few, a few head, heads. There are, there are uh, well, here we have 10 of the main frigorifics this eight frigorifics, uh, they manage 90% of the production. The three, the, the three bigger, the five bigger concentrate 50% of the production for meat. These frigorifics are Brazilian capital. There are some legendary names of the in the names of the frigorifics like Miner, Minerva, J, JBC, that now it's also with Minerva and another small groups, but especially Minerva uh, concentrates, Minerva concentrates the biggest share. The, Consumption in the consumption within the country is around 10 to 20 percent. Uh, when when it grows, uh, it exports, and this is a very elastic market. That as soon as there are more cows, then there's more people eating them. And the characteristics of this last years and almost always is that the price the ex the exporting price is the one that's going to uh, influence the local price. Yes, we listen to you. Uh, I heard something, I heard a noise and I thought I was out. Uh, Paraguay has a traditional model, which is to use the natural prairies and this is a little bit uh, exaggerated for, for me, it, it, this uh, clear parts within this uh, forest, which is uh, 
Chaco forest and uh, livestock started there historically, but that changes around the around the the interest to to increase the production, and this is the new model, the agro agribusiness model that has been growing and has been producing this huge uh, livestock, uh, uh, which are based on deforestation. These are some numbers on deforestation, but I want to share the map, the actual map of uh, forest cover in the country. We can see that most of it has been uh, def deforested. And uh, we can, you can see uh, how uh, it is. This is how it started, and that's how it started. The most common map. And this is how it has it has grown the deforestation. I don't know what's happening. It's not it's not working, but uh, we're we're following. This is what we still have of uh, forest in uh, in the oriental part, in the eastern part. And you can compare it on how it looked in 1945. We could see that it was a more than 50% and there were big parts of forest. But right now, from an ecological point of view, we can, we can uh, see how much it has the correct. I don't have a, a new picture. This is from 2002, but you can you can imagine that it's more white. And the Chaco, which is like the the, the, the region, uh, I can share from uh, until 2015, but we can see how it is. Everything in green was like the natural settlement, and then we can see the white part or the red part are the, the areas that have been deforested. But from a region that we can see that in the 90s was 75, we can see in 2015 that is totally deforested. And especially there is a big part of deforestation. This that we see here, I don't know if you can read the, 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 the layout, but um, we can see here very clearly that uh, the, the continuous green that these are the last forest that we have in in the country, and ninety percent of this this is because of the expansion of livestock, and with a very short period of time. This has happened in the last twenty five years, achieving these levels. It started with a deforestation of 30%. In 20, 20 years, the deforestation, uh, we have gone for a deforestation around 60% in less than 20 years. Uh, there's a picture. Last, uh, that, uh, that territory is where uh, the Yoreo people live. Uh, we have uh, Bolivia in the north. We have uh, we have uh, Argentina. Uh, some Ayoreos are still under uh, voluntary asylum. Uh, 
And in the last years, deforestation was the highest in the world. It's not only deforestation, but it also represents the genocide of these people because they don't know how to live otherwise. Biodiversity in Paraguay, um, I'm not going to surprise it, it, Equatorians or Colombians with these numbers, but uh, with deforestation, we're going to we're going to win everybody. Uh, Paraguay has the less, uh, the worst distribution of land. Only 10% of the land is in public, is public uh, land. And also protected areas. And all the rest has been privatized and landstock wants to keep on growing. So they want to keep on expanding the uh, livestock uh, sur surface. We are not reaching, they saying that we are not reaching 50% of the forestation. I don't know how they are calculating these but the process of deforestation is going to end with the last natural formation during the next year, let's say between 2026 and 2028. And this is the way, uh, this is the way cows eat in our country. Thank you very much, Miguel, for sharing with us these reflections. They are pretty, Sad. However, we can think about uh, the social story of livestock because our traditional people and and communities they learn how to eat with domesticized animals. We're not talking about livestock. However, they did have their own practices con uh, regarding food. We are seeing that the agri-food system is increasing, as Miguel said, and these practices, they do not appear within a country, and this is risking the, the own existence of the, of the peoples, like the Ayoreo people. We see that this is repeated with different types of livestock like the one mentioned by Natalia. And on an important element that we can see over here is the is that people who eat um, meat are do belong to the a high class people. We can see that we are sacrificing our countries, our ecosystems, our knowledge and our own systems in order to produce locally food just for a global system. So we should, if we would look at the countries that uh, this meat is going, is being exported, we will see that the destination is Europe, is China or the United States. So thank you very much for highlighting the uh, traditional business of growing a cow. As you were mentioning, there were seven enterprises. So over here, we can see the some reflections concerning the cooperative power, which is also present within the agri-food business within the world. This has an impact within the um, the diversity negotiations, and we should put this in, we should uh, question it, this. And then concerning the climate, Leticia is going to talk to us about climate and about the relation that exists between the livestock and land grabbing. And she's also going to mention the impacts on democracy. Leticia 
She is a sociologist and she's the national director of the NGO FASE, which is the, feder the federation of organization for social assistance and education. She works with environmental justice, agroecology, and climate. She is a member of civil society networks such as the Agricola Sao National de Agroecología and the ANI Working Group on Biodiversity. She also belongs to the Belém Charter Group and it has been a member of governance and social participation spaces, most recently the Ecological Generation Forum of the Environment Commission of the Federal Senate. We are going to we give the floor to Leticia and I hope that at some point when we will finish with the presentations, I hope that we will be able to have a little debate during 10 minutes and we will talk about different ways and alternative, sustainable alternative, different strategies in order to tackle this um, this power our, that belongs to our government and the development work bank. With the presentation of Leticia, I think we are going to be a little bit sad after listening to her. We want to have hopes and we don't want to leave this webinar just saying, oh, everything is lost. So Leticia, you have the floor, you have 10 minutes and thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. I'll give people a little bit of time so people can change the interpretation um, because I will be speaking in Portuguese and I'm very thankful for the care that was given to us uh, for the interpretation in Portuguese. First, I'd like to say that I'm very happy to be here participating in this meeting of the Global Forest Coalition. Um, being here and seeing my companions, um, people who I always like uh, listening, like Inez, Andrea, I'm very happy that hopefully soon we'll be able to see each other uh, physically soon. I'm kind of tired of seeing everyone in Little Square, so I'm really hoping for the opportunity for us to see each other in person and also build our strategies in a more concrete way because I think just this virtual space, it's impossible to see how we can take advantage of this moment, singular moment that Latin America is living at the moment, which is crucial. This singular moment should be strengthened by the Global Force Coalition. Uh, that said, I would like to start my presentation I don't know, let me check if you guys can see it. One minute, please. Okay, here we go. So I think that when Andrea asks us to start thinking about alternatives, it's because the cattle farming in Brazil, and as Miguel has also shown in our region, it's intrinsically connected to the environmental issues. But before everything, it's connected to democracy because in our regions, our countries that are super diverse, it's impossible to separate the land and the environmental issues. Therefore, the democratic issues as well. And that's why I want to call the attention at this moment that we're living in Brazil to try to restart democracy. So starting with a panorama, uh, did the slide change? So starting from a general panorama of the cattle production in Brazil, so again, we're going to be talking about cattle uh, itself. So I think the first step that we need to see 
uh, that's ha been happening in the last couple of decades is an increase in the cattle and the beef consumption around the world and the changes in the eating habits and cultural eating and the necessity for a standardization that the corporative power has uh, the ability to maximize it. Brazil is the second biggest pro producer of cattle and the first biggest exporter. Thank goodness, Miguel, we don't have two cattle heads per inhabitant, but we have a little bit over one uh, cattle per inhabitant. And we noticed that during Bolsonaro's government, this has in, number has increased a lot. So 2017, uh, we had 224 million uh, cattle. And the prediction for 2023 is that there'll be 228 million um, cattle in Brazil. In Brazil's case, there has been a reduction. It's not proportionally big, the number of deaths of, of cattle that's being killed. Uh, but, and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit. So in 2018, 32,000 cattle was killed and 2022, 14 million. So this cattle occupies 200 million hectares. And we also have traditional characteristics of cattle being grown just as in Paraguay. And this is one of the reasons why it occupies 75% of the rural establishments. This means about a fourth of the Brazilian territory. So if we add this to the production, uh, to the soy production in Brazil, this is about a third of the Brazilian territory. In Brazil, however, there is a production of heterogeneous cattle. So it's partly extensive with uh, small, medium, and large productions that are not connected to, to frigoríficos. Uh, and in Brazil, uh, just as you notice that what Miguel has already been spoken, but also the incorporation of these family industries. And it's also what we have been talking of the industrial chain of meat. It doesn't finish with the processing of the meat. It actually increases uh, and works along with a big chain that is the soil production, which is basically for expo exportation. But then it's also, it doesn't only satisfy the cattle, but also chicken and pork and others. So, so around of the 77 million uh, grains that are cultivated in Brazil, 43 million are, of hectares are for the soy production. So soy is, overtaking the production of grains in Brazil, in Brazil. So back to the production of meat, there's an important data that I remember that the one of the last few activities that I participated with the GFC, we presented the data where the internal consumption in Brazil was around 80%. So different from soy, the soy exportation was around 20% of the total product produced in Brazil. And this scenario has been changing lately. So today we have a prediction that for 2023, the exportation of soy 
uh, sorry, of cattle will be around 36% of the total production of cattle in Brazil, of meat in Brazil. Uh, but you can see that it's also decreasing a little bit. So the this data comes from the Observatório do Agronegócio, which is an entity from the government, the Ministry of Environment. So this is a channel. If you want to know more about the agribusiness in Brazil, you can look for it and get very rich data about the industry in Brazil. So what is the repercussion of all this cattle and all this soy in Brazil? And especially in a Brazil that has been participating in a recent loss of democracy. So today, Brazil is the sixth biggest uh, greenhouse gas emitter. And 44% of these emissions are of change of the use of the land. So deforestation, land grabbing, uh, and 28% is, uh, is farming. So 72% is of Brazil's emissions is related to agribusiness. In 2019, we saw an increase of almost 10% in emissions. And this was a moment where other countries were decreasing and Brazil was increasing their emissions. So specifically, the sector had an increase of 23%. Here is the data of the emissions uh, in Brazil. The emissions related to change of use of the land, you can see at the bottom in green. And as you can see, it follows along the same curve of the deforestation. And the top one in yellow is the agribusiness. Uh, this graphic is a little bit more interesting because it shows the relation between emissions and deforestation. So the curve that you see here is the deforestation in Brazil. We see an increase uh, that includes the moment of Bolsonaro. So from 2018 to 2019, the deforestation increased from 7,500 square kilometers to 10,000 uh, square kilometers. So from 2019 to 2022, there was an increase in 62% of the deforestation. Uh, last year, it was almost 13,000 square kilometers. We're here only talking about the legal uh, Amazon, but there were other Brazilian biomes that were deforested. And most of this concentration has happened in the state of Pará in Brazil. Andrea, I'm a little worried about time, so please let me uh, be aware of my time. Let me know if I'm going over. But if we start to think about the details of our emissions, So we can see that a large part of this was the fermentation. So if we think about the, uh, the, the land uh, that has cattle, and this comes from the data from 2017, I don't know if you can see where my mouse is on the screen, but you can see that in the central west area of Brazil, where we have the states of Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, Goiás, there is a small quantity of spaces, but it is the biggest area, is the area with the biggest quantity of cattle. So in the same way we see in the north, 
it's not the biggest region, but it has a large concentration of cattle. And this is where we see the states of Amazonas, Pará, Rondônia. If we look this in details within the states in Brazil, we see, for example, that Minas Gerais is a state where we see a lot of cattle, but it's a state that also has uh, a large quantity of establishments of cattle. So Mato Grosso has a small quantity of cattle establishments, cattle facilities, but it has a large quantity of cattle. So if we compare these two states, Minas Gerais has 50 uh, heads of cattle per establishment, per facility, versus 200 in Mato Grosso. Also, if we look for the regions, both the central west and the north, they are the biggest regions in Brazil. And this means around 70% of Brazil's territory. And we see that this is where is the smallest quantity of establishments working with this. So if we start thinking about the deforestation, there is a pattern of deforestation in Brazil. There's a new geography of deforestation in Brazil that we see that it used to be in this arc where I'm showing with my maps, and it's starting to expand in more remote areas of Brazil. So here in the heart of Param, is where it happened the day of the fire in 2019. So if we look at the expansion of cattle based on states and regions in Brazil, we're going to see that since when Bolsonaro was elected in Brazil, we see an increase of cattle in the Amazon in the North region. So we can see the increase of cattle production, the data that I showed in the beginning about the increase of cattle in Brazil. And this increase has been happening in the Amazon. So if we look at the maps of each state, what we see is that in the case of Pará, the line that is this one that I'm sharing with my mouse is the increase of cattle. And it also follows the same line of the deforestation. So there's a phenomenon that has been happening that the quantity of cattle has been increasing. There is a reduction in the slaughter of cattle because yeah, we saw that Brazil has a slow slaughter of cattle, but it's actually as working as a way for land grabbing in Brazil. Let's move on, okay, I have two minutes. If we look specifically at cities, we're gonna see the same pattern like in Malta Vida, Paraná, and we see the same pattern. I think this part I need to go a little bit faster, but we have been seeing a moment of concentration of the industry, the agro-industry and the political concentration. So we need now to strengthen the power of the people, but we've also been seeing that there's an increase in the political power and the financial and technical power. So in the case of Brazil, agribusiness is actually controlling the Brazilian Congress. So it takes our power away to ch make changes. And they have a lot of financial and technical power. So in Brazil, maybe we can go back to talking about this, but there is a parliamental front that is uh, related to agribusiness. So there's also the institution that we have to be aware of. I don't know how much you've been seeing about Brazilian news, but the agribusiness sector in Brazil 
And also the sector that we call negationists, they have been the main culprits for terrorist attacks in Brazil and attacks towards democracy. I think I'm going to conclude here. Maybe one last uh, thing about democracy is that the same agribusiness is also connected to crime. So those horrible images that we've been seeing with the Yanomami people in Brazil and also land grabbing. Um, thank you, Andrea. I'm sorry for taking a little bit more of your time. Muchísimas gracias, querida Leticia. Vamos. Thank you very much. Time always runs against us in these scenarios. But thank you for the reflections because they also bring very important points. How these changes on this agrofood systems have changed on our diet. Well, at the beginning, I put a song about fruits that uh, are from Colombia. But if we do a survey in Colombia, many people do not know about this, uh, about these fruits. And this shows us how the colonialist has been imposed by the diets. And not only about the diets, but uh, to design the region to, uh, to serve the needs of the North that are related to extractivism and hydrocarbons. And we see how this food, agro food system is colonized. It, it comes from the colony, it's patriarchy. If we, if we see uh, the data of uh, Solon Foundation, has a very interesting uh, studies about uh, how women participate in uh, agro systems. And they only found one woman in one of this uh, in these systems. Women are not deciding in this colonial system that is being imposed. Uh, an ag agro food system that is uh, related to other colonized systems. Leticia has talked also about the agrotoxics, and we have also talked about soy production, soybean production. So we see the whole chain and how it's impacting women, indigenous people, uh, forests and waters. And everything is linked to big corporations, globalized corporations. And for this, we have invited uh, Meryl van der Falk. Uh, maybe I'm not pronouncing in English um, the, the, the name is being uh, debated, the tra traduction, but it's about how the banks are supporting this livestock systems. Uh, so Meryl is going to talk to us about it. She, she works with uh, the synergies about animals and, and, and banks and promoting animal welfare and changing uh, food systems that are more respectful with animals and plants. It's also part of the uh, coalition for stamp banks to analyze the relationship about these institutions on deforestation. Uh, thank you, Meryl. Thank you for uh, being with us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and to organize this, this 
invitation, so I'm going to speak in English. I think it's working right. So I would like to talk a little bit about the um, soft financing factory farming campaign, which is a campaign of a coalition of organizations um, from different parts of the world that is focusing on the role that development banks play in financing industrial scale um, livestock. So both the expensive, um, extensive production of, of cattle in Brazil and in Paraguay and other places in, in Latin America, but also the intensive production of, of pigs, of chicken, and the, the production of feed that is required to feed these animals. So we are focusing our arguments around the impact that industrial um, scale livestock production has on almost all the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. These goals are generally uh, supported by development banks, and we think that they have um, their policy banks, so they should support this. They have like a moral duty, but it's also they have committed to these goals, so they should guide their finance in such a way that it actually supports the achievement of these goals. So we think that financing industrial scale livestock is actually damaging um, SDG 13, for example, regarding climate, the SDGs that are related to biodiversity, the ones that are related to human health, to social justice, and also the animal cruelty, which is not a specific SDG, but it is in there as well. So I'll just walk a little bit through our key arguments on why we think that development banks should stop completely in financing factory farming. So starting with the argument about climate, as you probably all know, but um, livestock, the production of livestock um, is a big contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. It contributes at least 14.5% with all the greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. But depending on the way that, that those are measured, it could be actually much more like up to a third of all greenhouse gas emissions might be able to be traced back to the production of livestock. It is a very strong contributor to the emission of methane with almost a third of all emissions of methane coming from livestock. And methane is a much stronger greenhouse gas than, than CO2. Um, so reducing the production of intensive livestock now would actually have a very important benefit in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions overall. And it will improve a lot our chances to achieve the goals uh, of the Paris Climate Agreement. Researchers have shown that if we don't reduce, sorry, if we continue as a business as usual, by 2030, the production of livestock alone would consume around half the budget that we have. So if you look at all the emissions that we can, that we're kind of allowed to emit, um, if we want to stay within the 1.5 temperature increase, almost half of that would be just for livestock. And if we if we look at 2050, livestock alone would would consume 80% of that budget. So there is no way we can achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement if we don't reduce livestock, because if 80% goes to livestock, there would only be 20% left, left for all the other sectors in the, in the world, and that's in the economy. And that's not that won't be enough to, to, to cover all the other sectors, right? So we need to reduce the emissions from livestock if we want to achieve the goals of the Climate Agreement. Um, the industrial life scale livestock is also reducing the resilience um, of food systems to climate change. So if you have very concentrated systems, when there is climate change, they are far more impacted. Like when there is a drought, um, the harvest can fail, it will impact the animals much larger. So the whole sector can be um, have a much larger impact than when you have like small scale, far more um, decentralized production of food. So it works both ways, it both impacts the climate, but it also puts our food system at risk for being less resilient to climate change. Um, going to the second key argument, which is around biodiversity. As was has been explained already by the previous presenters, it's a major driver of biodiversity, and that is both for the production, um, biodiversity uh, loss, sorry, and that is both because a large part of all the land is being used uh, for pasture for, for cows. And the other part is due to the deforestation linked to the production of soy for feed. 
as was mentioned in the in the previous presentation. So the land use change caused um, driven by the production of livestock is a major driver of biodiversity loss. Then there's also the use of pesticides and fertilizers in the production of feed or in the produce production of the pastures that has a huge impact on biodiversity and which is causing these ecosystems to be more, more fragile. The um, population of wild animals is decreasing very sharply. And it's one, one element that can show you how bad it is that by now almost 96% of all mammals on earth are either humans or livestock. So only 4% of, if you take all the weight of all the mammals that exist on earth, only 4% are actually wild animals and all the rest is humans and livestock. And a similar figure exists for birds. 70% by mass of all birds on earth are now chicken or poultry. And only 30% is our wild, wild birds. So this is, shows like how much we are shifting the balance of wild biodiversity towards very monoculture very few species of animals that are dominating the presence on the earth. Of course, there's a huge impact as well on the health crisis. Zoonotic, the production, intensive production of animals is a huge breeding ground for zoonotic diseases. Animals are often keep, kept, as you can see in this picture, in very small spaces, overcrowded, very dirty. And these animals are genetically very similar. So if one gets a disease, the other ones can get it also very quickly the viruses can mutate or bacteria can mutate um, easily and it becomes this huge breeding ground for, for diseases. We've just been through a huge pandemic. There are other pand pandemics raging around the world which pose risk to our, all our, our health, not just humans, but also that of um, other species in nature. And it's UNEP has warned us about this risk and the risk that the next pandemic that will greatly impact humans will come from, will be originating from uh, the intensive production of animals. So this is really a very important reason to, to stop producing animals in, in such a way. Another really important uh, factor as well is anti antimicrobial resistance. In some cases, about 80% of all uh, of the consumption of medically important antibiotics happens in the livestock sector. So animals are fed, live, uh, animals are fed antibiotics not to cure them, but to prevent them from becoming sick because they're kept in such dirty circumstances. So if we were keeping these animals in a healthy place, they would not have to be fed antibiotics because they, were not, they would not be at risk of becoming so sick. And then also related to health is the fact that the overconsumption of, of especially of processed meat has been linked to various diseases like heart diseases and, and diabetes. So that's also a reason to reduce and to shift our diets to more plant-based diets rather than insisting so much on the large scale production, production consumption of meat. Then there are also the social conflicts, which are, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, unfortunately. Um, big livestock companies, as was shown before by Miguel, they, they, they occupy a lot of land and as very often there are land conflicts, there's a lot of land grabbing involved. Um, of course, there's the pollution from using different kinds of pesticides that will impact the uh, food production of local communities. It will impact their gardens and, and pollutes people that either work at the, at the place or live nearby. The corporate concentration has a huge impact on, on social justice and, in, and food sovereignty. It's, it channels all the money that is earned in that sector to a few rich people, whereas local communities are unable to compete and also often kicked off their land. So they also lose the means to produce and secure their own food sovereignty. And it produces very few jobs and, and most often, especially the slaughterhouses produce very dangerous jobs, very badly paid jobs. So the argument that, that they're actually good because they're creating jobs, it's is not true because they prevent people from producing food in a sustainable way, in a healthy way, healthy food by their own means and, and kind of force people to work at these horrible places that are badly paid and, and are a huge risk to their own lives. And just also because the, um, the arguments is used so often that we need to produce more meat because we need to feed the world. The production of meat is a very inefficient way to, to feed people. 
So livestock production worldwide only accounts for 18% of all the calories consumed by us humans and only 37% of all the protein, but it covers three quarters of all the land. So of all the food that is produced, uh, just a quarter of the land produces more than 80% of all the, the calories that we produce. So if we would reduce the amount of land that we use for livestock and instead use more land to produce uh, plant-based food, we could feed the world with a lot less land. And that would at the same time, it would guarantee food security, sovereignty, and at the same time also free up land to do nature res restoration, which is so badly needed, considering all the damage we've been doing to our planet. And then lastly, the, the argument that unfortunately banks are not very sensitive to, but which is also really important, is the animal cruelty. The way we keep animals is really, it's really very cool. Like pigs are kept in cages so small, they cannot even turn around. Um, often the animals suffer greatly from the lack of being able to do anything. They can't even walk. They can't interact with, with other species. Um, with specimens, they often suffer very, suffer very hurtful mutilations. And they are bred to create traits that, that can be very harmful there for them. So chicken, the broilers, they're, they're genetically manipulated in such a way that they grow very fast so that their own feet often can't sustain their weight, which means they lay down very often and lay in their own feces, which then causes, causes burns. So it's, um, it's a very cruel industry to animals. Yet, um, sorry, I missed, I forgot to pass the slide. So just to, to wrap up, unfortunately, development banks keep on pumping loads amounts of money into this sector. Um, estimates from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism have indicated that over the past decade, development banks poured almost 5 billion US dollars into big meat companies. And that is particularly worrying considering the impacts that the, this industry has on all the different SDGs that supposedly development banks are supporting. Development banks are not the main financiers of this industry. Um, commercial banks put much more money, money in the sector. Um, feedback research has shown that just in the between 2015 and 2020, and this was just for a selection of companies, but they received almost 500 billion US dollars from, from over 2000 banks and investors. But the, the reason we focus on the development banks is because of their role and their commitments to support development and supporting industrial scale livestock definitely does not do that. Thank you. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, querida Meryl. Thank you very much, Meryl. You are showing us a different perspective and you are showing us the relation that us as humans, we have with the rest of the species. And over here, we can see a deconnection. We are a part of nature. We are not here, not related to the nature. We are not here to dominate nature so that we are facing some challenges and we uh, we are in the Global Forest Coalition. We are in different networks like uh, in factory farming. And this is why we want a world where everyone can live so that we need to connect everything that has been separated up until now, which has been separated in an artificial way by a capitalist system and that is based on con colonialism on par on uh, and we need to colonize our food systems and we need to change our ways of relating to our ecosystems and put together all these parts that have been separating we need to say that we all know a lot of things. We need each other. We need to exchange our experiences. I think that Leticia can uh, can talk about this. Nobody is going to save nobody, and nobody will will get to save 
um, himself or herself, as Paulo Freire was saying. So that this is why we need to create some solutions from a local, regional and national, uh, on national level. I don't know what are we going to do with a question because I've been thinking about it during the last 20 minutes. And during this last uh, moment, we would like to talk about the campaign of stop the financing factory farming so that we will be able to ask to development banks to stop financing these activities, which are very dangerous for ecosystems. And we would like to ask you, uh, first of all, I'd like to share my screen and I would like you to ask to join an action that we are promoting. Um, so uh, we would like you to join this letter so that we will ask that a loan of $32 million won't be provided to a project of uh, milk expansion in Brazil. We have been doing some research and this, this research has shown different risks, such as risks to children, risks in matters of deforestation. So one of the concrete actions that we would like to ask you from the campaign is to join this letter. I hope that from Brazil we will uh, we will get some help in order to to broadcast it. This is one of the actions that we can do at an international level. And if you want to join, because we are going to explore what loans are going for intensive life, livestock. And it's a space that needs local spaces so we can generate, start eroding the cor corporative power. Um, we need to, to remember that power goes through all the sectors. So one of the campaigns, like where all the ingredients of your, of your food are coming, because it's not coming from just the store or the supermarket, but to lead to, to see until the until the we should have work uh, we should have finished two minutes ago but we can keep on going so we can speak a little bit more and if you have any questions you can write me to our email in order to start a dialogue with the with the discussion. Ines, thank you very much. I want to thank you for this space. Very nutritive in information and reflection. And also thought around different perspectives uh, that Natalia, Miguel, and Leticia have shown, have shown a very com complete panorama. And I want to show the other phase of the people that, that, that conserve strains uh, uh, of uh, local local animals, uh, either birds or uh, livestock, that other kind of uh, 
livestock is historically has gone along the evolution of humans, part of our part of uh, it's it's a sorry because uh, thank you Andrea because you have shown the colonial racist patriarchal north south uh, focus of this problem this problem is not a problem of our people it's a problem of the north, uh, the consumers in the north. That's where it started, and that's where the finance is coming, which is also part of the strategy that Miguel has shown up. That uh, the consumers are basically in the north, and they have, don't know what's happening in the south. We have to to make a call to the mean to the to the coalition to keep on resisting colonialists to keep on fighting uh, to keep on fighting for the territories for all the human beings and um, please can you sh share with us the presentations because that will give us uh, inputs for our work thank you ines we have the we are going to keep on working on these alternatives from the uh, from the territories and from the people uh, the alternatives the alternatives to these systems anybody else wants to make another another comment or are we going to be sad with this information Go ahead, Gerardina. Uh, I am a, a grassroots worker in the Amazon 20, for 20 years. Rivers, Amazon, this is what I have lived in these years. And there are some things that systematically keep on keep on appearing like uh, the ownership of the land. I have been in uh, in Colombia in the deforestation. Deforestation uh, levels are high and we're fighting with our uh, neighbor municipality and we're trying to go back to the traditional, but uh, it's so complicated because even to buy like things like cilantro, to make the, the plate and to analyze, like Andrea said, we have to analyze what is in our plate to explore poverty in our in our countries. How, how much meat you consume in the year or how much milk you consume, those are indicators on how a family lives and their poverty indicators. There are new indicators that we, we can do a poverty study, which is more real about uh, the stomach and the nutrition of our people and because like buying meat in Cali is very, it's almost impossible. And it's all around what we have in our hands. I'm very happy and I'm going to stay as a student in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Gerardina. We are all, we are, we are all sharing this, uh, information and we have to see how we can move together because it's also uh, an Im a global imagine Im Im imagine and we have to decouple this kind of uh, imaginaries so i think it's important to 
to have to continue with this kind of activities and to plan something another webinar very soon to have more lectures from the global south from the global south we have Wengo from china and it's important to to have this to have these alternatives I hope uh, that today we can send the letter because the loan will be approved on uh, April 30. And this, uh, the deadlines are very short for commentaries and that's a strategic so people cannot react. We are sending in the, ne the next, the next steps are going to be to share the, the presentations and we need to organize what Ines says, it's important to visualize all this, all this uh, alimentary systems, food systems that are not eating our forests. Time is always short. I'm very happy that, uh, thankful that all of you are here. And if you can turn on your cameras so we can take a, a picture and we can see each other. So please open your camera so we can share a moment together.